Greetings fellow earthlings, welcome to my video about the golden ratio. So in your high school algebra or math 103 class, when you're asked to solve for x for this particular equation, you go straight to the quadratic formula. And after a bunch of boring algebra and number crunching, you end up with this exact value. And you circle your answer, you move on. You don't really care about what the answer is, what the equation was, as long as it gives you the correct answer and full points on the assignment. What we are going to do is pull back the curtains so we can gain a better understanding how math applies to the real world in the places we least expect. First of all, let's get a basic understanding of what the golden ratio is. It was first written down by Euclid in his book, and I believe the year was 300 BC, and it's still unclear when exactly it was discovered. This was just the first time it was ever recorded. And let's read his definition of the golden ratio. A straight line is said to have been cut in extreme and mean ratio when, as the whole line is to the greater segment, so is the greater segment to the less. Okay, so what does this actually mean? Let's say we have a string, and we cut the string into two pieces. The long side is A, short side is B. The question that Euclid was asking is, where do we cut it? so that the ratio of a plus b to a is equal to the ratio of a to b. Now, how do we go about solving this? Well, we have to start somewhere, so let's just cut it half-half and see what happens. So as you can see, the ratio of a plus b to a is 2 to 1, and the ratio of a to b is 1 to 1. And that's not exactly what we were looking for, so let's try someplace else. Let's cut it 4 to 3. So the ratio of a plus b to a is 4 to 3, and the ratio of a to b is 3 to 1. And keep in mind that we want the two ratios to be equal to each other, so once again, this is not what we are looking for. So let's try again. So if we cut it here, the ratio of a plus b to a is 7 to 5, and a to b is 5 to 2. Let's give it another shot. So now the ratio of a plus b to a is 8 over 5, or 1.6, and the ratio of a to b is 5 over 3, or 1.667. So now we're within one decimal place. I could spend the whole day doing this guess and check method, and I'd get closer and closer, but I think we can all agree that that's just a waste of time. How do we find the perfect cut? Well, that's exactly why we have this wonderful thing called algebra. So let's say the ratio of a to b is some ratio, we'll call it phi, and let's just make it equal to a. Let's say that the ratio of a plus b to a is also equal to phi, because we want it to be equal to the ratio of a to b. And with a little bit of substitution, we can make it look like this. Multiply both sides by b, the b's can divide out, put everything on one side. And that looks familiar, because remember, from the beginning, we had actually solved for x, but in this case, we'll call it phi. And the exact value of phi is 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, and that's approximately equal to 1.618. In case you're wondering, yes, there are technically two different values for phi, and one of them is negative, one is positive. The negative is negative 0.618. But in this situation, we only care about the positive, because we're talking about the ratio of lengths. Negative wouldn't really make any sense. This ratio, represented by the Greek letter phi, is the golden ratio. There's one more thing that is related to the golden ratio that I'd like to talk about before looking at some real-world examples. The Fibonacci sequence was first introduced in a book written by an Italian mathematician, Leonardo Fibonacci, in the year 1202. And how it works is that each number in the sequence is the sum of the two preceding numbers. So 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, and so on. If we talk about it in arbitrary terms, the number in the sequence, we'll call it f sub n, is the sum of the two preceding numbers, f sub n minus 2, and f sub n minus 1. Let's look at the ratio between the numbers. So let's divide 1 by 1, and that's 1. That's kind of boring, so let's just keep going. And the second ratio is 2 divided by 1, which is 2. Now we have 3 divided by 2. It's 1 and a half. Now 5 divided by 3 is 1 and 2 thirds. 
So it looks like we're going somewhere, see if there's any kind of pattern. And we have 8 divided by 5, it's 1.6. 13 over 8, 1.625. So it seems like it's leveling off to something. 21 divided by 13 is 1.61538. And now we have 34 divided by 21, 1.61904. 55 divided by 34, 1.6176. Now we have 89 divided by 55, and that's 1.6181. So it seems like the 1.61 is has stayed fairly constant. Now what if I were to keep going and dividing each number by the previous number? And as we go way off to the right in this sequence and the numbers get really, really big, is that ratio approaching some value? To figure this out, we need to use calculus. And we can ask the question, what is the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n over f sub n minus 1? Now let's rewrite the fraction so we can try to make sense of it. Remember that f sub n is just the sum of the two preceding numbers f sub n minus 1 and f sub n minus 2. And now we can pull apart this fraction and write it as two fractions separately. That first one it can actually just turn into a 1. And the second fraction, if we flip it over and say 1 over f sub n minus 1 divided by f sub n minus 2, we can make it look like this. Keep in mind that both those fractions in red are taking one number and dividing it by its previous number. And the really interesting conceptual part of the process is if we take the limit of both sides, we notice that those two fractions in red, they're pretty much saying the exact same thing as n goes to infinity, and the numbers in the sequence get really, really big. And that means to clean up this equation, we can just rewrite those fractions as something else. We'll just call it j for Jessica. And so we can rewrite it like this, multiply both sides by j, move everything over, and there is that equation again. And we know what the solution is. It's the golden ratio, 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2. Once again, we only care about the positive value since we're talking about the ratio between the numbers in the sequence. You're probably asking the question, why do we even care about the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence? Is it even useful to us, and where can we even see it in real life? We actually see it in the proportions of the human body, and believe it or not, it's used all the time in Photoshop to give people perfect faces. And it also is seen in the number of flower petals. Most flowers come with petals in multiples of Fibonacci numbers. We also see it in the placement of the bridge in songs. And I actually tried this with a couple songs. I took the total time of the song and divided it by the time where the bridge starts. And on average, I would come pretty close to the golden ratio. You should try it for yourself. Another thing that I actually noticed on my piano is the ratio of white keys to black keys. There are 13 keys in one octave, eight white keys to five black keys. And between five white keys, there are three black keys, and between three white keys, there are two black keys. So I just found that pretty interesting. And another place we see the golden ratio is in art, architecture, graphic design. It's used very often to make logos more visually appealing. And I could go on all day about all the different places we see the golden ratio and the Fibonacci sequence, but the example that I really want to focus on is the placement of seeds in sunflowers. Let's take a field trip to mathisfun.com. So the first thing we need to know is how sunflowers make seeds. The seeds are pushed outwards from the center of the flower in a spiraling pattern, and a new seed is made after every turn. The question is, how far should the flower rotate between seeds in order to maximize the number of seeds that fit into a limited amount of space? What would happen if we took one full rotation between every seed? Well, we would end up getting a straight line, and obviously this is not the most efficient way to organize seeds. In fact, we would get the same result if we were to use any whole number. So let's try entering in some fractions. 3 over 2, or 1.5, would look like this. 5 thirds, or 1.6 repeating, ends up having 3 spokes. This is because we're taking 5 one third turns. Let's try a few more. 8 fifths or 
13 over 8, or 1.625. I'll do a couple more, just pay attention to the number at the top. By now, you might have noticed that the numbers I'm using are the ratios between the numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. Those numbers can all be written as fractions, which is the reason why we still see a lot of wasted space. With the bigger numbers in the sequence, such as 89 over 55, or 1.6181, we can't really count the number of visible spokes anymore, but we can still kind of see the similar pattern, and we don't want that. From this, we can conclude that we're looking for an irrational number. Let's see what happens if we use pi. So that didn't really turn out as we expected. There's still a lot of wasted space. Let's try another number. How about e? It looks like e is not the number we're looking for either. And why is this? Well, it turns out that being irrational is not enough. Pi is close to 1 7th, so it ends up having 7 spokes and E is close to 5 7 so it also ends up having 7 spokes. Let's use the golden ratio. And it works! The reason why phi is the best number is because it's not a transcendental, like pi and E. This means that even though it's irrational, it is a solution to a polynomial. Does this mean that plants know math? In a way, yes, I think that plants do know math. Before I end this video, I want to give a quick shout out to the one and only Goldie Knox. You may also know her as Lonnie Cock, one of the KCC Matthews. And there she is in her gold helmet and jersey number 1.618. So thank you, Goldie, for inspiring me to learn more about the golden ratio.